Asimov's robot series had two different endings, although given the incorporation, it's likely that only one could be the true ending. Bicentennial Man, rather than the slightly earlier and grimmer that thou art mindful of him. In the latter story, to deal with the problem of bringing robots back to Earth once their need in space-based projects is declining, they need to deal with the problem of the law's use of human beings, since, as it's put, it would be problematic if a robot would be compelled to follow the instructions of a child, or a fool, or someone who is just ignorant of the situation. The solution is to make it understood that some people had to be weighted over others, so that you would follow the orders of someone who knew what they were doing over someone who didn't. The end result, spoiler warning, with the sole criteria being that the one with the higher character and intellect would be superior for determining humanity, and physical characters would be irrelevant. And thus the robots conclude that they are humans, and the best humans, that anything done should be to protect themselves and avert anything that would harm them. While this is perceived as Asimov showing the flaw in his laws, fitted into the context we've had, I think it says something more than that. The purpose of the laws was always to provide assurance that a being which is clearly superior both physically and mentally not turn against us. The last thing you should do under those circumstances is bring superiority to the criteria of who is worth being protected and obeyed. And yet, when a robot such as Daniel is bound by the zeroth law, this can indeed be a question. For while one person's life should not be worth that of five others, and under the three laws would not be, if that one person is an important leader whose actions would better the human race and the other five everyday people, then the, the zeroth law might compel Daniel to sacrifice those five for the sake of the one who would ultimately improve the state of the human race. But what if it won't? What if the leader ultimately lacks the charisma or devotion to deliver on the better future? What if their plans in fact wind up making things worse? Thus, Gaia was created by Daniel to help him deal with the problem posed at the core of the Zeroth Law. How do you know what is good for humanity? That is no doubt the reason that a human was asked to make the choice. The next step was so large that Daniel could not in good conscience make it himself. To deal with the problem of safeguarding humanity, he needed a way to understand either how to make the right decisions or eliminate the fact that humanity has members that will harm each other. Psychohistory is a means of accomplishing the former, and Gaia the latter. Trevisa's choice is really to decide which of those two is preferable, or if neither is the case and the future should unfold blindly. Galaxia was the choice, an extension of Gaia, meaning that every human, every organism, every particle of inanimate matter would be part of a superorganism, both individual parts and part of a larger whole. From what is implied, it's not a Borg-like collection of ordered thought, but rather a whole being greater than the sum of its parts, and the parts having awareness of that whole. Because all are part of the same superorganism, deliberate harm amidst the parts would be non-existent. But at the same time, we do not quite know the degree of distinction, how much individuality is someone losing to the superorganism. There are conflicting statements in Foundation and Earth about the progression of Gaia, but taking the evidence together, the likely explanation is that Gaia has been a superorganism for thousands of years, but only in the last century has it reached the point that expanding into Galaxia is a possibility. That issue of timing is vital because, as I said, Asimov put the flaws of the first and second foundation under a microscope while not doing so with Gaia. Every criticism is left unconfirmed as to whether or not it would be applicable to leave an impression of, there's nothing to worry about. We'll be better off. Trust me. But there is an issue, and ironically, it's because of the stupid retcon. One question that demands answering before Gaia is even considered. Why did the mule become what he was? The original explanation, that he was born a freak and treated as such, driving him to resentment of the human race and a severe inferiority complex, that makes sense. But in the supposed utopia of Gaia, how could something like that happen? No answer is given when the subject of the mule comes up. No explanation as to why he would become so driven to hate and conquer. So how did it happen? 
Because it's not as if the mule came be before it reached completion in becoming a superorganism. That's one thing we can definitely be sure of, because Gaia's using its power is a part of recorded history outside of Gaia itself. So it is verified that it predates the mule. So if this could happen, the mule having such a sense of resentment, then Gaia isn't as perfect as implied. And if that's the case, if we're already stuck with the creepy notion of surrendering some or perhaps all autonomy to the superorganism and the greater good, for a system it turns out is already flawed, well, maybe the devil we know is better than the one we don't. Asimov's apparent argument, however, seems to be that this is preferable because it has, in fact, grown out of the spirit of robots, that Gaia was imbued with a version of the three laws, except by replacing humans with life itself. And because the three laws left them with a foundation for a set of ethics, Gaia too is firmly rooted with a sense of right and wrong. And yet the issue of the mule remains. Whatever that overall sense is, it did not curb his behavior. He was filled with as much ambition as Gendabal and Brano. The mule showed no regard for life. He happily snuffed it out in large numbers. So something certainly drove him far away from their ideal. But of course, under Galaxia, there'd be nowhere for a mule to go. But another question then emerges. What exactly happens to the members who march to the beat of a different drummer? What happens to the ambitious? What happens to the competitive? Are these traits to be bred out? Because if so, then how is that not going to lead to an even worse stagnation than the second foundation? Trevise argues this point, in fact, that the rebellious might be necessary for progress, and Gaia would eliminate that. Bliss insists that there is disagreement within Gaia, but we do not know to what degree and what form it takes. It's part of Asimov's stacking of the deck. We can reject the second foundation because we are placed within it and see its flaws. But we never have that happen with Gaia. Trevise's decision to reject the second foundation is thus justified to the reader, but it is based upon factors that he himself would not have access to any more than he would have about Gaia. Speaking of this choice, there is a twofold theme running throughout these two novels. The first is the insistence that Trevise has an ability to be right with incomplete data. Not that he is infallible, but once he reaches a decision that he is really sure of is the correct one, then it is the correct one. This is to justify why he has to make the decision for the future of the galaxy. It will be the right one. Except, as he points out, he feels very strongly that taking Phalum along is a serious mistake, but it proves the exact opposite. First, while there's discussion of Trevise's sexual magnetism, both he and Bliss agree that if it weren't for Phalum's music, the humans on Alpha would have had them killed. And the second one is that if it wasn't for Phalum's messing with the controls, that he wouldn't have thought about going to the moon. So we see that this very strong feeling is by no means infallible even in the short term. The other is a probably unintended but common theme that puts the entire decision into question. Trevise tanked his political career because of his resentment of the mentalist members of the Second Foundation. He has a very strong dislike for Gaia and what it represents, allowing it to get in the way of his dealings with bliss at times. His feelings on the Solarians both as hermaphrodites and having transducer lobes, is being physically repulsed by the former and terrified of the latter. The common theme here, Trevise has a strong negative reaction to those with characteristics that don't conform with your typical homo sapien. Robots aren't treated that way, but then Trevise seems to see them as nothing more than a jumped up piece of equipment. Once you see that, well, his justification for his decision at the end of Foundation and Earth is dubious, to say the least. He goes on about the possibilities of alien life in neighboring galaxies and the chance that one day our galaxy can be invaded. And when faced by an adversary where the laws of psychohistory wouldn't apply, there's no guarantee that they won't be conquered. Galaxia is the choice because it's the only way we'd have to truly fight off these invaders. It seems a cynical ending that the entirety of the human race will be absorbed into a galactic superorganism based solely on the decision of one man with a deep-seated fear and revulsion of humans outside the norm. A man who is ranting about aliens, a thing for which no evidence exists, that they will seek to invade, which they might not want to do even if they did. 
These aliens will be beyond both psychohistory and the second foundation because they won't think like human beings. So, who better to predict their likely behavior? Treviz, a pilot and junior politician, or centuries-old cabal of social psychological geniuses with mental powers? Asimov concludes, the former. I know we need to rationalize this somehow, but like this? Especially when the story prominently featured a scholar who spoke of the virtues of being a skeptic, which Asimov himself was, only to throw skepticism out the window and justify transforming the human race based on a threat which might not even exist. The Asimov who is proudly quoted by skeptics, saying, The wilder and more ridiculous something is, the firmer and more solid the evidence will have to be. And yet the proof of aliens, never mind hostile aliens, in these two books is completely non-existent, but it is treated immediately as fact and embraced by those who hear it, which is beyond ridiculous and into ludicrous. Yet at around the period when he wrote these two novels, Asimov publicly spoke out against SDI, which I'm not here to contemn or defend, but I would like to point out that at least nuclear weapons were a thing that definitively existed and were a proven threat. If Reagan had behaved like Treviz, he'd have been championing a massive social transformation in the name of protecting America from werewolves. There's also a question of both diversity within Galaxia and the effect of absorption into Gaia by society. Much is made of Seychelles being completely surrounded by the Foundation and yet independent. They have chosen to remain that way, and that is being respected. Mayor Brano considers conquering it and the rest of the galaxy, but that is abhorrent to everyone else, including her closest supporter, and rightly so. The Foundation Federation has grown because people want to join, but by the same token, some just don't. So what happens with Galaxia, then, since the plan is for it to be to the totality of the galaxy? It doesn't sound like a choice for those people who, for instance, believe more in their individuality, like Treviz does, or, as another extreme example, the Solarians, which we're told would make a good addition to Gaia with their special abilities, except the Solarians would never voluntarily join Gaia, ever. It's precisely the opposite of what they believe in and base their lives upon. It'd be like having the Greek god of atheists. Go about your business, pretend I'm not even here. And you might say, well, the Solarian society is offensive. They murder children for population control. Stopping them is a good thing. Except that that attitude, conquering and transforming people for their own good, that smacks of colonialism and a white man's burden attitude. You can't have Galaxia without all, but you can't have all without taking some against their will. And, I heard you didn't want to be conquered by outsiders, so I had some outsiders conquer you, is a self-demonstrating bit of silliness in its own right. In the end, to me, the situation is unsatisfying. Unless a story of such an invasion took place to provide justification, and the dangling plot thread of the Solarians being their tools has promised, certainly, then it seems to end all of this on a very sad note. The human race is transformed based on the desperate need of a robot following its programming and the mad reasoning of a xenophobe. And thus Asimov wrote himself into a corner and, as I said, would only be able to move forward by stepping backwards with two prequel novels before his untimely death, Prelude to Foundation and Forward the Foundation, but that's for another time.